All right, I think I'm back. So the last time in version one, um, I which was about eight minutes long, right before my internet went down, and I don't know what happened, but Jared came in and fixed it, bounced the cable modem, and I think we're okay. Um, but uh, let's keep our fingers crossed, and we'll knock on all the wood and do all the superstitious stuff that we have to do uh, to make this work. So I was talking about, and I hope that nothing that I say is going to jinx us and make me lose internet again. I hope not. Um, Maybe it just needed a little restart, you know. Everybody needs that. It's like a little teeny nap, and then you get to come back. So thanks, cable modem. Thank you, Internet. Thank you, Google+. This is pretty awesome. And here I am at my house. It's bedtime for my kids, and we're just going to hang out online now. So that is very cool. So I have posted on my blog this week about... Um, about a really cool offer that Silhouette is offering until the 14th of August, which is a super cool discount on the Silhouette Cameo, which is the 12-inch wide version of the Silhouette cutting machine. And the cool thing is that about the Silhouette is that you can kind of bridge the gap between the digital world and the traditional crafting world because you can use all of your digital stuff, especially fonts and shapes and things that you create on your own, and actually cut those out and then use them in the physical world. So I shared a project on my blog earlier this week. In fact, I think it was yesterday. Yeah, the days sometimes zoom by and sometimes I'm like, wow, I've lived like four days and only one has gone by. I don't know what happened. So I posted a project yesterday that I had created in Photoshop and then cut out using my silhouette and I wanted to talk a little bit more about that in a little bit more detail so that you could see kind of the process that I went through and then give you plenty of time if you want to take advantage of that coupon code. It's got my name on it. Um, go over to my blog at blog.jessicasprague.com and the little image at the bottom will give you the link over to be able to purchase yourself a cameo. Um, if you, um, while you're there, also be sure to participate in the giveaway because I get to give one of those sweet machines away as well. So we are live over here on our Google event page. Let me just make sure. Looks like it. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about our process for designing something for cutting out with our silhouette. And then I'll show you everything's opposite here in, in this Google broadcast. So it's kind of a mirror image, but I'm used to seeing, you know, like, like this is my right hand, but it's showing up on the left side of my screen. And so it's just a really weird kind of a, okay, do I go this way? Do I go this way? So anyway, right over there, um, you can see the project that I did, and I wanted to just talk through just a just a step or two that I did in Photoshop before we go in and talk through kind of the process in Silhouette. So feel free in the Google event page to continue to ask questions, and feel free to um, ask questions on my blog or on YouTube. So, <laughs> let me just check and see. It's pretty trippy doing stuff live, right? So being able to kind of see things right over there and I'm watching myself from just like a minute ago and then watching people talking and 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 it's the worst thing possible for someone with ADD. So, because now I'm like, oh, something shiny over here. Oh, people talking over there. Look, there's me over here. Oh, my gosh. Oh. So, just gonna take a little second. I'm going to chill out. And now let's switch over to Photoshop. You can do this in either Photoshop or Photoshop Elements. 
I'm going to go ahead and grab elements here. And let me just pull up the file and then I'll switch over. All right, I'm going to go ahead and screen share so you can look at something a little more interesting. There we go. So this is what I put together for cutting out in the silhouette. Basically, I created a new blank document and set that to a transparent background because I figured that would be easier to trace and we'll talk about that here in just a second but then um, then all I did was put together some of these little images from a label pack that I linked up on my blog so the one that I wanted to talk about was this one right here so I'm gonna go ahead and just delete this and zoom on in so we have this really cute little curving label right here see it and there are lots of these available kind of everywhere online. You can get them at iStock Photo. There are some even in the jessicasprague.com shop. And they're really cool for being able to put titles or other labels and things like that on. But you can see that it's got a curve in it. So Photoshop and Photoshop Elements actually make it really easy to be able to type on a curve like this without much trouble at all. And we can keep our type editable so that we don't have to throw it away and type it again if we screw it up or if we want to go back and edit. So I'm going to switch over to black, just type the letter D to switch to our default of black, which is our foreground color. So that's the letter D. And now we'll just grab our type tool, which is right over here, the T thumbnail here. And now we can just click down. And I'm going to use the thirsty script font, which is one of my current favorites. I just cannot stop using it. So I'm just going to go ahead and just type here to get close to the thirsty font. There's thirsty script and I'm not sure how big it should be so I'm just going to start typing and then we can come back to that to that size. So I'm going to say work hard. That's about right. So what we'll want to do here is just select over that type and now you can see that we've got this little option right here down at the very bottom or depending on your version of Photoshop it might be up at the top in the options bar that's just like a little T with a curving thing either underneath it or on top and this is your warp text function and this is something that I don't think gets used often enough because it's really cool as long as it's used with intention and not abused and that's really the distinction that all typography needs to have made right so for this particular case we want it to be a flag shape so the difference between flag and wave is that wave is going to keep some parts of your text straight and flag is going to wave all of the parts of it so you can see the wave has a little square around it and the flag looks literally just like a flag shape so we're going to want to use the flag and you can see that our bend is plus 50 so that means that it's going to come down on the left and up on the right and if you wanted it to be reversed then you would switch this down to negative whatever to come up on the left and down on the right we are going to be in the positive numbers but it's not going to be quite 50 let's try something like 20 we want this to be as 
little a bend as we can get away with because it does distort the type just a little bit. Makes it a little bit hard to read and it kind of distorts the the letter forms themselves. So we want to do as little bit of a bending as we can get away with. And then our horizontal and vertical distortion just kind of help overcome a little bit of the of the kind of shift that happens when you're bending letters. So horizontal distortion actually lets you kind of shift it towards the right a little bit to where this left edge gets a little bit smaller and the right edge gets bigger. We probably don't need too much of that. And then vertical distortion, same thing, except that we're going to go up to down. So you can see that right here. So I'm actually going to go with just a little bit of a vertical distortion because of the letter D right here. But before we do that, let's go ahead and just commit that and then we're going to rotate our little line of type here so that we can actually see it in the context it'll really be used in. Maybe just a little bit more. And I think that this could be just a little bit bigger. So here's the nice thing. Right over here in our layers palette, you can see we've got a T with that curving thing, but we can double click on it and all of our type is completely editable. So we can actually just change this to something like 34 if we wanted, which completely changes the shape of that curve. And we need to come back and figure out what we're doing again. I think maybe that's a little too big. This time I'm just going to shift it down a little bit. There we go. So this is how we get our type to follow along that curve. So all I did at this point was go ahead and save this off as a PNG file or ping. Sometimes, sometimes designers call them pings instead of PNGs. So save this off as a ping file and then we just need to launch our Silhouette Studio. So let's grab our Silhouette Studio And this is the software that we're going to use in order to get our file ready to be cut in the silhouette. So it's there's lots of stuff you can do in here. I haven't explored but just a tiny fraction of all of the stuff that you can do in here. So I'm going to show you what I did and then in the future we can explore some more options together. There's lots of drawing tools and of course, the main thing that designers all love is that you can actually just type in pretty much any font you own and it will be cut perfectly. So what I did was actually just open out my open up my file, which was right here, and we're looking for our PNG. And that comes in like so. And I wanted this to be something like whoop, We go. I wanted this to be something like 11, almost 12 inches tall because that was the opening, that's the size of the opening for my frame. So you can see right here that it gives you actually how tall your artwork is. I've got some space up here and some space down there. So the other thing that we see here is that this is the kind of cutting mat background.
Um, let me just make sure that since I switched... Oh, huh! You're not seeing any of that, are you? Okay. Still new. Still new to the screen share. Still new to the... Where, where am I? Silhouette. There it is. Okay. There we go. That's why it pays to have an eyeball over on what's actually happening on the broadcast. So let's rewind. That's the noise that rewinding makes in my head. And now you can see I've opened up this PNG file. Now you can actually, actually see that I've opened up this PNG file or this ping file. And I basically just clicked on this corner thing and resized it so that it fit inside of here. And you can see right here along the left-hand edge that it is almost 12 inches tall. So here is the file that I had to work with. Now you can't just kind of bam this over to the cutting machine because it's not going to know what to do. What you actually have to do is trace around all of the shapes here so that it can create so that it can create the tracing, the traced file for you so that it knows what lines it needs to cut. So the way that we do that is actually just to come over here to trace, which is this little green button right up here, trace, and then it says select trace area, and we'll just click and drag to give us a little trace area here, and this is the part that really threw me. So, well, so that's why I'm kind of passing this along. So basically, what you see here is the yellow blobs. Yellow blob is good. Black blob not good. And so, what we have to do is actually show the Silhouette Studio software what exactly is an edge that needs to be cut and what isn't an edge that needs to be cut. So we don't want these little these little spaces right here in these larger sec segments to be cut as well. So what we need to do is actually come over to our high pass filter and our threshold. So what that's going to do is allow us to basically control the amount of coverage that each of these little shapes is going to get. So I'm going to push my threshold up to something like, okay, so see how see how the whole thing went yellow? We don't want that either. So we want to bring this back down until that yellow disappears, which is at about 50%. And now we can come back with our little high pass filter. And I'm just ticking on that little up arrow there until as much of that gray blob stuff disappears as possible. And there we have it. So now what we do is just hit trace and you can see when I move my PNG file you can actually see here is exactly what your cutting file is going to look like. Awesome. So when you, you can actually just throw this whole black piece away because the silhouette software isn't going to care about it at all. The only thing it sees are these red cut lines that we have created here. So let me just show you, I'm going to come back now, come back to myself. There we go. Hi! So let me just show you. What you do next is actually just put the to do with my thing. Oh, it's over there. Okay, so it the silhouette comes with a with a kind of a plastic sheet of carrier mat that's that's about this big and it's got sticky stuff on it. And so you just cut off a piece of vinyl and you stick it down. Keep the sticky backing on the vinyl and you just stick it down onto that sticky carrying sheet. And then you stick it into. I'm saying sticking a lot. You put it into the silhouette hit cut, make sure you set it to vinyl, hit cut, and then it will come out 
having already been cut and hooray. So then you'll end up, what you'll end up with then is the need to actually peel all the little negative stuff away and that's really the thing that takes the longest. Now here's what mine ends up looking like. There we go. Okay, so you can see, oh, okay, so you can see right here, here's work hard, just how we did it. And you can see that the lines here are really, really detailed. I'm going to bring my hand around so you can see. Okay, so you can see right here that the lines are really detailed and that it did a great job of cutting exactly according to my design. Now I'm going to put this back. Okay. I mentioned on my blog that I have I have this thing about pattern paper, you know, when I found scrapbooking, I was super excited because I I found this whole hobby that makes it totally okay to to buy school supplies for the rest of my life and that I can have as much pattern paper as I could collect and store, right? And it, and it's totally okay. And I loved I love that and I even though a lot of the crafting that I do now is digital, I still collect pattern paper and I still have tons of it. It's right over there. And some of it is a little bit even too pretty to cut up. So um, so sometimes I frame it like this. And I've actually had that piece of paper framed for a long time, but it never totally felt like artwork yet. And so adding in that little piece of my, you know, a little kind of family motto in vinyl over the top of that did it up just right and now I think it's perfect. So the little motto says, we work hard, dream big, pray always, and have fun. And that image is actually available both as a PNG file and as the already traced out silhouette file on my blog at blog.jessicasprake.com. So I hope this kind of gives you a little bit better idea of, of kind of the process that, that it is to create an artwork in Photoshop and then take that into your silhouette software, trace it, and then send it out into the real world. That's, that's the part that's so cool, right? It's just like, okay, I made the stuff up, I typed some stuff on my computer, and I added in some little zha zha zha, and now it's going to go hang on my wall. And I just think that's awesome. So that's one of the reasons why I really like the silhouette in general. It's just that it it allows us to cross that divide between our digital world and our physical world in really immediate ways. You know, you can do that project from start to finish in a couple of hours, design included, and that's really cool. Now, if you already have the design, then it's minutes. You can do all kinds of cool stuff. The silhouette will cut a lot of different materials. So far, I've only done paper and cardstock and vinyl. So, um, so check that out, and uh, and you're you're going to be seeing more projects from me um, using this trusty device because I really like being able to design my own stuff and then cut it out and use it right away. So, a couple of questions here related to the to the silhouette is. Um, the, okay, so Wendy asks how we open the PNG in Silhouette, and, and yes, I was actually sitting in Photoshop, having neglected to switch over to, <laughs> to the Silhouette software in my screen share. So I just, you know, I just like switched over there, and I didn't think that you, that I, I had to actually click any buttons to switch software, but I did. All it was is just to file and open navigate to the place where you've saved off your PNG file and there it is and this works for every PNG file so if you think about that as okay we have cutting files yes but we have pretty much every PNG file on the planet that you can use as a as a cutting file to be able to get awesome stuff out of your cutting machine kinda of mind-blowing wow um, another question, Rosalie asks, how, how we open SVG files if you don't have the design software. The, the software, in its kind of basic form, comes with the machine. So you can either download that from the Silhouette website, or you can just install it using the DVD that comes with the machine. And that'll be where you go to do all your typing, or where you go to open up files. And then there's an additional kind of designer 
level software that's I think it's about 50 bucks that gives you more functionality and I'm not completely sure what you know what the kind of levels of stuff you can do this you can't do this kind of thing with with those two pieces of software are um, but you can go check that out at the Silhouette website. Let's see. Melanie would like to know, she says, I love putting quotes and sayings and word art and wonders if she can get them in our shop. Absolutely. There's lots of different cutting files as well as um, just flat out being able to, to use any of the brushes that are done in PNG format. You can actually just pull those in, do the tracing like you saw, and then be able to cut those as well. The other cool thing that I have not explored at all, but I was just kind of dipping a toe into when I was looking at this for my project that I posted yesterday was this ability that the Silhouette has called print and cut. So it'll actually send one file to your printer which is the image that it needs to print out and then you bring that back and stick it onto the carrier mat and Silhouette will then cut out the shape that your printer just printed. That's all I have to say about that, right? Amazing! So, um, so definitely um, go and check that out. Um, Shalanda Great question. She says, the PNG file that I just created, is that something she can learn in the invitation class? Absolutely. That's a great place to go and and um, check out a lot of different kinds of wording, you know, setting words together um, would be the invitations and announcements class at jessicasprague.com. The other one that you might check out is my poster design class as well. Um, so th that was more kind of Photoshop and DigiLife, um, in addition to being just me loving on my silhouette tonight. Um, I'm super happy I own it, and hooray. Oh, and if you haven't checked it out, they just sent me these. Um, haven't tried them, looking forward to. These are actually the silhouette sketch pens. So instead of cutting, you can actually send a file to your silhouette and you'll actually you actually pull these pens out and stick it in where the where the little knife blade is on your silhouette you replace your knife blade with one of these little pens and then um, it'll draw the drawing instead of um, instead of cutting it out whoa so we actually got to see the folks at Silhouette when we were at CHA just a couple of weeks ago and they've got some really cool stuff in the works um, Another one of their cool ones that a lot of a lot of us who are who are either traditional crafters or kind of cross the line between both traditional and digital crafting is that they've got a rubber stamp or an acrylic stamp making mechanism now that will allow you to actually to actually cut out images to make acrylic stamps with it. So that part is really cool as well because there's just places where stamping a Photoshop brush just won't work. A few places, right? Not many, but a few. So let's see, other, other kinds of news as far as the, the website goes. Ah, oh, okay, so Shalanda, thank you for that testimonial. Shalanda says the pens work great. So um, as we get through kind of working towards the start of school and working towards the fourth quarter of the year, I can't even believe I'm saying that right now, it's just the bare beginning of August, um, we're going to be having more silhouette project classes where we'll, we, we'll be able to take things, you know, kind of start out in the digital world, add some stuff, create some stuff, and then then take it on out into the physical world. I've got some instructors who are going to be coming and showing some different projects using your silhouette. So take advantage, you know, you are worth it. So um, the uh, some of the other news, let's see. I'm going to be oh, okay, there is one. 
there is I'm just trying to think of what I can say. Mm -hmm. What what secrets I can reveal. So um, st everybody mark down, mark it down right now. Like seriously, I'll wait. Go go get a pen and a paper and and write this down right now. Or open up your calendar program or grab your phone and Labor Day weekend. We're going to have a huge huge celebration. And part of it is that you know, it's the end of summer and everybody's like, "Oh, summer is over and we're going back to school." But a lot of us who are who are actually sending kids back to school are like, "Yeah." And I mean that with you know, with all of the love for summer and and what have you. Um, I'm excited though. I'm excited. You know, Rowan's going into fourth grade. Can you believe that? And Elliot's going into third grade, and I can't believe that. And and truly, they they do so well in school when we can, when our family gets on the routine, and it's awesome. But anyway, Labor Day weekend kind of marks that sort of end of summer, beginning of fall kind of time of year and we thought why not have this giant celebration so we had our birthday celebration back in June and that was cool we don't want to wait all the way till Christmas though because that's just too long to wait to have like a big fiesta so we're gonna have we're gonna have a celebration on the 4th of July weekend save up your shekels because we're going to have some very cool stuff happening um, kind of a new we're going to reveal a new look for the website, and there are going to be some announcements as far as new classes go, and I think it'll just be a super cool time. So let's go ahead I've, with just a few minutes left and see if we got any questions. Questions? Let's see. Deborah asks, what steps would I recommend for someone to become a digital designer? Now that is a really good question, and it's there are a lot of parts of, of that of that question that you know might change my answer a little bit. Depends on really um, if you're talking about designing digital scrapbooking supplies as a hobby or if you are talking you know if you are wondering how you become a digital designer in getting um, you know in kind of joining a shop and being able to sell your stuff um, so you know that the question is a great one and it's one that I get a lot um, the what I can say really the the key thing is, and this is really my opinion here. Um, <laughs> this is my show, <laughs> so um, so what I really th what I really think here is that I think you have to be a really good digital scrapbooker before you can be a really good digital designer. Um, mostly because it's in the using of the product that you get a sense for what product is used and how and that's really um, that to me is a key thing um, that I don't think you know I don't necessarily think that opinion is shared by certainly not everybody um, and I don't even know if it's shared by that many people but I think developing your skill and your eye for good design as a scrapbooker is a great place to start as you begin to go and create your you know to to shift over or your desire to shift over into creating digital supplies there are a lot of things that cross over so um, you know all of your basic knowledge about file sizes and file types and delivery mechanisms and all that kind of stuff all that translates over but then you'll hit this point at which you kind of have to make a choice and something that um, that every person who who changes their hobby into something that they do in a more serious way or or on a more you know on a more formal level I guess um, you have to you come to that point where you have to make your choice is this going to be something that you do 
because you love it, because you want to, or is this going to be something that you do because you want this to be your job? And whether or not, you know, uh, totally beside the questions of whether or not anybody makes any money being a digital scrapbooking designer or whether or not, you know, you could you could start your own shop or get into somebody else's shop or percentages or or any of the other kind of cloud of of questions that that go along with with you know the discussion of being a digital designer i think i think right now um, you know what what speaks to me about your question is that choice that you have to make that says this isn't going to be my hobby anymore. This is going to be my job, and everybody who you know plays the banjo in their basement and then decides they want to be in a band and tour has to make a, has to make that choice. And everybody who who makes art in mixed media in their workroom and then gets the chance to do their own solo show at a gallery has to make that choice. And um, that's a choice that I made a long, long time ago. But given the fact that there are only a certain number of hours in a day, one of the things that you have to really, you know, think about um, as you're kind of deciding what you want to do with this hobby. You know, there's lots of lots of places you could go, lots of things you could do. Once you know Photoshop, there are a million things you could do. And that's really my goal is to get everybody to the point where you have a level of skill that you can make choices like that. Yeah, you could do this for a living. You know, you could or you could design scrapbook product for a living. You know, if you wanted to throw your hat in the ring as a graphic designer, if that was something you wanted to start building skill in. Awesome. But just be sure that when you start making those choices that you go in with your eyes wide open as far as understanding that what you that you're actually giving up a hobby that you love and you enjoy because it's never going to be your hobby again. And that is, you know, there are times when I, you know, when I get a little sad about that. You know, yes, I have hundreds upon hundreds of scrapbook, right? Lots and lots of memories stored. And and I'm proud of all of the work that I've done. So don't get me wrong in any of that way. But my scrapbooks aren't like, they aren't the scrapbooks that they would be if I hadn't been making those pages for a living. And they aren't the, that isn't necessarily the work that I, the body of work that I would have done if I hadn't been making them in order to either show people something or to teach them something. And that's the beginning and end of it. So when you're kind of doing this sort of thought process about, you know, do I want to use my skills that I'm developing uh, to, be a, to be a designer, think, of, think as well about the trade-off. You know, the, there's always going to be a cost that for us in our industry is not about investing $200,000 in getting your first line printed. You know, the barrier to entry in Digi is really low. You can, you know, pretty much every one of us sitting here has all the equipment and all the technology that we need to be able to do this. What we, what we need to make choices about is the time. And if I had to, um, you know, all I can do is sit over here and 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 give out, you know, dispense dispense info and advice. Um, but if I had to make a recommendation. I would say step in slow into the digital design world and don't let go of your hobby as a memory keeper for as long as you possibly can. And and that, you know, to me, I've been privileged because I haven't because of the kind of unique position I'm in where I still make scrapbook pages. I, I haven't had to totally give up my ability to still make pages. I still get to do that. I still get to take pictures of my kids and 
and look at them. And you know, most of the digital designers I know don't scrapbook, and that's just the that's just the fact. They just don't. You know, that is not that is just not a hobby for them anymore because they're so integrated into the industry. It, it's not a hobby anymore. It's their job, and that's. Um, the point of what I was trying to say there, I think, is that you know these are the trade-offs we all have to make, right? But if I had to offer up anything from the last, let's see, oh my gosh, so I just passed my nine-year scrap anniversary in July, and if I had any sort of whatever, you know, as far as this journey went to give out is just that of all the stuff I regret the least, it is the fact that I have hundreds upon hundreds of scrapbook pages to remember and to show my kids and to to give. You know, I've made some kits. I've made several dozen kits, you know, and I'll, and I'll continue to do that. But what I'm not willing to give up is my chance to still be a memory keeper in the capacity that I've been able to to kind of arrange it. If, if I were to have to make the choice, I hope I never do, have to make the choice between being a teacher of Photoshop and being a memory keeper, I don't know. I don't know if the price would be too high for me because even though I am a teacher, I still get that end result and I'm motivated by this fact that not only do I get to do this authentically, you know, not only do I get to share this with you and to be able to show you how you can use your computer to tell your stories and to keep your memories, which are absolutely one of the most precious things that any of us own and we get them for free. What I get is I, I also get to capture those and tell those stories in my own way in my own life for real and that's I think one of the things that keeps me going it's not it's not only the click and go here and open this and print this it's you know this is my life too and I get to keep it too and and remember and savor and save and all of that stuff that I'm always talking about that's real all that stuff about you know you and and the photographs that you take and the stories that you tell and how important those are and the level of influence that you as a person have over not only the people that you can see and the people that you interact with every day but literally the hundreds of people that through those people and those people after them that are touched by your life and your actions and the efforts that you make in savoring your life and in really trying to capture and be delighted by the details of your life the effects of what you do are so far reaching that you'll never know the the number of lives that that you and your focus on these little wonderful bits these little wonderful stories that you're collecting as you go along, you'll never know the level of influence that you have as, as a person whose life is dedicated to seeing and savoring and capturing these little moments. And that is the kind of person that I want to be. And that is the, the kind of life that I want to live. One that, even though it seems a little bit simple and it seems a little bit maybe isolated since we we you know sit here in our in our rooms and most of us don't even know another digital scrapbooker or another digital crafter in real life right or if you do it's one but there are hundreds hundreds of thousands of us all over the world and that collective energy and that resonance that we get when we kind of get to talk to each other even if it's on a chat or in an email or in a broadcast like this that says 
you know what, what you're doing, not only is it okay, it's so, so important. Keep on doing it. Keep on taking pictures. Don't ever put your camera down. Get out that phone, get out that camera, and keep taking photographs. Because this is what, these memories are it. This is your life. Um, I'm going to tell one story, and then I'm going to, um, and then I'm going to close for the evening. So please go ahead and keep writing questions, um, and we can address them next week. I had a I had a significant experience happen to me just a couple of of. Let's see, it's been a couple of uh, six weeks or so ago. My parents came to visit for my my. Um, my son's baptism. And the backstory is that when I was eight months old, my parents were living in in Rexburg, Idaho. And they're just about 20 miles up the road, up in the canyons, there was a huge dam made out of earth. And it was one of the biggest earthen dams that were, that um, has ever been created. And it was to hold back um, the the it's called the Teton Dam, and its job was to keep out the water so that all of the land downstream could be um, could be used for farming. Well, I was when I was about eight months old, um, that dam burst, and it was a wall of water that was six feet high, stretching for miles across, that just decimated that entire valley, and you know, the people that are my parents' age talk in terms of the time before the flood and the time after the flood in that entire region of the state, even still. And um, because it, it absolutely just um, destroyed everything. And one of the casualties of that flood was um, all of my dad's childhood pictures and mementos and everything. Everything from up until the time he was about 22 is, is gone forever. And, the, and there's nothing, you know, they have yearbooks, you know, and a, a couple of newspaper clippings and that's it. Well, um, and, and, you know, the longer that I live and the more photographs that I take, um, the more tragic that gets to me that that uh, you know I, I'll never get to see that stuff so six weeks ago my dad comes in um, you know they, they live in Idaho still and and my dad came in and said I have something to show you and he he is not a very excitable guy which is funny because he has probably the most excitable kid me that there ever that there ever was you know it, where where I'm just kind of always ah you know he's just a super mellow you know keeping it close to the vest kind of a guy but he was just bouncing and I couldn't I couldn't figure out why he's like I have something to show you and he was so excited um, and he pulled out his phone and he turned it around to me and he showed me He showed me two photographs of himself as a teenager. These are the only two pictures that I have ever seen of my dad before his wedding day. And he has never really let on to how important he thought what I what I do for a living is um, and has never you know has never been all that um, you know effusive about it I guess but he was so proud to be able to show me two photographs of him when he was a teenager, um, knowing how very much 
they would mean to me not only as a memory keeper and somebody who who teaches memory keeping and talks about memory keeping and argues for memory keeping and blogs about memory keeping and speaks about it and goes around the country and what have you but also as his kid who loves him that I got to see those only two pictures that exist and they have happened to have fallen, I guess, into a box of other stuff that my parents ended up taking out of my grandparents' house when they were being stored. I mean, it was just this whole weird cycle of stuff that happened that those two slides ended up in the bottom of a totally different box that that was in a different lo location than the flood that came through. And it's it resolved forever that feeling that 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 I had looking at those two sweet and completely imperfect photographs from the 60s of my skinny scrawny dad as a skinny scrawny teenager solved forever in my mind the question if there ever was of the value of taking pictures of keeping that camera out and close to you I don't care whether you have little kids at home. I don't care whether you, you know, you're only photographing your fur babies or your garden. Your life is important. And what you have to say is important. The people who will share your memories that you might not even know yet will thank you. They'll be grateful for it someday. Don't ever, ever doubt that. And this is how I'm going to close tonight because I'm going to go and get a little tissue or what have you. Um, thank you so much for participating in this evening's event, whether you're watching it live or whether you're watching it kind of after the fact. Please don't hesitate to email me a question, jessica at jessicasprague.com, or post on my blog as a question, or post even in the event page um, as, you get, as we get future weekly events going. So... Thank you so much for participating in this. I hope that you were able to kind of think a little bit more about what's possible with your silhouette, and I hope that you're able to think a little bit more about keeping your camera out, keep your phone out, keep taking pictures, keep savoring and saving those memories. Have a wonderful night, and I will see you soon. Good night.